Welcome to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you the tools to develop a balanced approach to health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette, board certified obesity medicine and family medicine physician. And I'm James O'Hara, family nurse practitioner. Today in this mini podcast, we're gonna be going over some frequently asked questions we get about a couple of supplements that have become very popular lately, uh, Fidosia agrestis and Tumcat LE. One of the common questions that we get from patients and also people on social media is, is Tomcat Ali or Fidoja a steroid? And this one's pretty easy. The answer is no. <laughs> Our next question we have is, what is Tomcat Ali? And specifically, maybe we talk about some of the differences between the Malaysian and the Indonesian extract. So Tomcat Ali is a plant extract, and there's two main active compounds. It comes from two areas for the most part. It comes from Indonesia and it comes from Malaysia. There was a study done and it was done in Indonesia by uh, a, a group from Indonesia. And they analyzed the Malaysian variety and they found toxic heavy metals in it. So there is a little bit of a conflict of interest there, but to be safe, uh, we would recommend going with Tongkat from Indonesia. Always a good idea to avoid heavy metals. Um, so, is Tonkat Ali safe is the next question that I have to ask myself as a provider because that's the framework we have to look at things through. What is the potential benefit of something and what is the potential harm? So, what do the studies tell us about Tonkat Ali's safety profile? There's a few things to keep in mind with Tonkat. There's a couple different proposed mechanisms of action. And as mentioned, there's two main active compounds. Initially, it was thought that it was an aromatase inhibitor, and of course, uh, taking aromatase inhibitors unless you need it medically for most people is not a net positive for your health. But that appears to be one of the minor mechanisms. There is also some evidence that it acts similarly to estrogen receptor modifiers. CIRMs are selective estrogen receptor modifiers, and some of the studies have compared it to Novaldex or tamoxifen, which is most commonly used in breast cancer. It does not appear to be as strong and it does not appear to be as selective as that. Um, so it, it's not a clinically significant aromatase inhibitor and more study is needed to see if the main mechanism of action is an estrogen receptor modifier. So for that reason, it seems a lot safer than taking an aromatase inhibitor, which some people do for testosterone optimization or a CERM like Novaldex. Yeah, that's a great point. And when we look at the studies and see what kind of dosages have been studied and what parameters have been monitored, we do have studies that go on for several months using doses up to 600 milligrams that show no kidney toxicity, no liver toxicity, nothing abnormal in the complete blood count, hematology parameters. So it does appear to be safe and the lethal dose is excessively high for animal models, preclinical models. So it does appear to have a good safety profile and some interesting benefits, which we'll get into. So looking into some of the literature, um, it is often pitted head to head against uh, things like CIRMs or aromatase inhibitors when they're doing in vitro studies or in some animal models. So I think that's where some of the confusion comes from the actual mechanism of action. So in certain instances, it does behave like an aromatase inhibitor or behave like a CIRM, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is one. As far as Tom Catali, what kind of increases in testosterone could somebody supplementing with this expect to see? There are several different studies. A lot of times you would expect if you're male, your total testosterone to go up by 100 or sometimes even more points. That's a pretty significant increase. That could be clinically significant. Uh, for things like uh, improving hypogonadal symptoms or even improving athletic performance for some individuals. Speaking of that, uh, let's talk about more uh, about the symptoms that Tonkat might improve. Yes, yeah, so Tonkat is a known aphrodisiac. Um, we see this in the preclinical models. Uh, the rats that are treated with Tonkat Ali, supplemented with it, will have increases in their uh, mounting frequency. They are described as sexually vigorous rats. Tonkat Ali also appears to have a anabolic effect independent of testosterone increases. So there was one interesting study that I wanted to bring up about Tonkat Ali where they actually castrated rats, put them on testosterone replacement therapy, and then treated them with uh, 
Tonkat Ali, and they did see increases in the muscle size of the levator ani, which is typically a marker of anabolism. So not sure what the relevance is there translating into human patients, but that was an interesting study nonetheless. I like the studies that are similar to that because uh, when you evaluate anabolic to androgenic ratios, they use assays similar to this. They usually use the cross-sectional area of the same muscle, the levator ani muscle, and then compare it to the changes in the size of the prostate. It's not a perfect estimate because the levator ani is not really a, a true skeletal muscle that you're usually looking at for an endpoint for anabolism, but uh, it's, it's better than nothing. Yeah. It's certainly a signal generating and hypothesis generating. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about um, the potential side effects of Tomcat and possibly get into Fidoja a bit more as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's no free lunch. Every supplement or medication can have potential side effects. So some of the things that are noted in the studies surrounding Tomcat are fatigue, upset stomach, headache, things that are nonspecific. Uh, and then you may have some side effects related to the changes in hormones, which could be things like increased oil production in the skin, which could precipitate some acne formation. Um, you could have a little bit of irritability and everybody's going to react a little bit differently. The important thing is that there's not toxic side effects, and, and these are things that you should explore and have a, a balanced discussion with your healthcare provider about before you begin to supplement with anything, just because you wanna be aware of what the potential side effects are and approach things like a scientist, you wanna control one variable at a time. So I would in, typically initiate one supplement, give a bu buffer time period maybe, three to four days, maybe a week, and then add in something additional so you can parse out what's causing a side effect or what's causing you a benefit. I think that brings us to Fidoja. Um, so Fidoja agrestis is something that's been talked about often. Uh, Andrew Huberman has somewhat popularized this, talking to Derek from More Plates, More Dates, and Joe Rogan, and many others. And there's been a lot of different supplement companies that have a Fidoja supplement. Uh, it's a Nigerian shrub or bush. I kind of think of it as a Nigerian tumbleweed, but um, that also has a couple different mechanisms of action. And it also, a uh, thousand foot view, it needs a lot more study done. But let's chat about uh, some of the risks and benefits and mechanisms. Yeah, absolutely. And you made a good point about it's not that well studied in terms of actual published human studies. Mm -hmm. uh, we have none. So we do extrapolate from the clinical literature. And then we do have a lot of anecdotal reports um, and some laboratory data that's come along with that. So as far as you know, Fidoja agrestis, uh, the question, is it safe, is a little bit hard to answer. Um, but how does it work and what do we see in the animal data? Yeah, so there's a couple different mechanisms. One is it does increase LH. We've seen this in the studies, uh, in mostly rodent studies. And then we've also seen it anecdotally. We've both taken care of plenty of patients that have been taking Fidoja for short periods and long periods of time. Um, people in Nigeria have also taken this for quite some time as well. So it's well known in traditional herbal medicine, if you will. And on that note, it's not uncommon for herbal supplements to be used quite frequently, even without well done randomized human trials. Um, that being said, uh, there will be them in the future just because it's been uh, so popular in the last year or two. Um, as far as the other mechanism, it also appears to increase the sensitivity of the LH receptor on the Leydig cell, which is the receptor that LH stimulates in order to increase testosterone. Um, there's a, a further benefit as well. It works on 17 hydroxylase. So it works on an enzyme in this steroidogenesis cascade that puts 17 hydroxyl groups on steroids like progesterone and pregnenolone to kind of move that into the androgenic side of the steroidogenesis cascade. Right, which is a similar mechanism to Tomcat Ali, which is why we may see some people experiencing a lot of synergy when they combine these two compounds. You're moving your sex hormone precursors into their intermediaries, which eventually become things like uh, Fort Andro, DHEA, and testosterone. Mm -hmm. One other 
uh, effect in the body that upregulates the same enzyme is hyperinsulinemia and hyperglycemia. You may have heard uh, bodybuilders or biohackers say that insulin is the most anabolic hormone in the body, and that's one of the reasons is not only because of its uptake of nutrients into cells, but uh, all, and its effect on the IGF-1 axis, also because of its effect in the steroidogenesis cascade. Yeah, and to talk a bit more about that, there's actually some data showing that uh, insulin sensitizing agents or glucose disposal agents like metformin and berberine may be net antiandrogenic. There are some studies in diabetic populations where you see the free testosterone go down a bit. Um, obviously, resolving the diabetes is a bigger target, but this is an area where we may be able to offset that one effect by adding in something like a Tonkatali combined with Fedoja, because while metformin, berberine, things that are insulin sensitizers may put the brakes on that 17-alpha hydroxylase enzyme, you may be able to offset that by using Tonkat Ali to speed that up again and get the insulin sensitizing benefits without a negative effect on your sex hormone production. Mm -hmm. So for certain groups of people, it has a particular potential for clinical applicability. Those groups would be people in a caloric deficit, people on medications which would cause hypoglycemia. You don't want too much hypoglycemia for sure, that has lots of other detriments. Hypoinsulinemia, people trying to lose weight so they're in a big caloric deficit. Uh, natural bodybuilders come to mind, especially around the time of the show. I'd be very interested to see uh, those cases. Um, there's also potential benefit of Tonkat in women with endometriosis um, because of several things. One is its effect on SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin. And then two, its potential as a very weak, safe or safer herb, estrogen receptor modifier. Right, Kyle. And this goes back to some of the studies we saw in the preclinical models where uh, due to the lower bioavailability of the Tonkat Ali extracts in oral form. They actually use some intraperitoneal injections in some mouse models, rat models, and they saw that it was able to oppose the effects of a potent estrogen called ethanol estradiol on the lining of the endometrium. So this is something that is, you know, theoretical. We have a mechanism behind it, have something with a good safety profile, but we really don't know how exactly that would translate into clinical, uh, clinical practice. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we see men utilizing Tonkat and Fedosia more than women, but it's likely safe for both groups. And as mentioned previously, certain groups would have more benefit. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the risk. Let's talk about the rat study on testicular toxicity. Just like the, the rat study on the levator ani muscle, it's very common in um, you know, the clinical literature looking at steroids to evaluate essentially how bad each steroid is on testicular tissue because obviously, um, you know, synthetic steroids and also even just TRT itself is toxic to uh, testicular tissue. Yeah, that's right. And there's a couple types of data that we're looking at to see what are the effects of these compounds on different cell types. So they've done this in vitro where you have cultured Leydig cells and they're exposed to Tonkat Ali and you do see an improvement in testosterone production by those cells. And you also see some degree of testicular toxicity depending on the concentration that's used. So there's going to be a, a ceiling effect on the benefit and then beyond that point, you're gonna to tend to run into side effects or toxicity. Uh, the more interesting preclinical model was an actual in vivo rat study where they used the Fedosia and uh, at varying doses. And they saw some doses where there was a transient uh, reversible testicular toxicity. And then they had some higher doses where there appeared to be some sustained damage there during the treatment. So um, as far as doing the dose, uh, animal dose to human dose conversions there, um, it appears that you know, the doses that you might be taking as a supplement are not quite as high as it would be used in these studies to cause the toxicity. Um, typically, uh, for an 80 kilogram person, we crunch the numbers somewhere around 250 milligrams would be a dose that showed reversible testicular toxicity. 
but what are some of the things someone could do to mitigate those risks? There's a few things. One is taking antioxidants. So one of the proposed mechanisms of toxicity is its effect on uh, different oxidative damage enzymes and oxidative reactive oxygen species recyclers, like gamma glutamyl transferase, which is GGT, which is very high in hepatic damage, very high um, in users of oral, um, oral steroids as well. Uh, another mechanism of action is alkaline phosphatase. So uh, things that you take for liver support otherwise can also help. There's good data that NAC or N-acetylcysteine, a glutathione precursor, helps attenuate testicular toxicity in multiple um, avenues. And there's also good data that Tudka does as well, which is uh, synthetic bile acids. Another good option is taurine that many take for testicular health while on TRT and other things. So those are th some things you can do that might help. The increase in testosterone in and of itself from Fidosia also might lead to some degree of toxicity. So um, that's something to think about. That's one of the reasons why we recommend taking a break or um, cycling on, cycling off in layman's terms. Um, I usually recommend people take it for about one month and then off for at least one week under the supervision of their own doctor, of course. Yeah, that's a great point. You don't want to be going um, in anything. You don't want to be going 100% all the time. You have to take breaks, whether that's a calorie deficit you may be in or training periodization. It's important to take a deload so you can apply that same concept, uh, let your body balance out a bit, and uh, it has mechanisms in place that are very resilient as far as things like you know, preventing that oxidative damage from occurring and tons of regenerative processes that we probably don't fully understand. So that's a great point. Yeah. One other thing to note with Vidosia is in the literature that we do have, the very minimal literature, it does increase LH, but not FSH. So the increased testosterone levels that you do get secondary to Vidosia very well may have some degree of, you know, normal negative feedback inhibition or decreasing the activity of FSH, which will have downstream effects on the seminiferous tubules and the Sertoli cells. And those have a lot of what we call autocrine and paracrine hormones, which are basically the same as endocrine hormones. They, they can be growth factors as well. They can be peptide hormones, but uh, they act locally in the testes. So those oftentimes their task is to help with hypertrophy of the Leydig cells. But if the body doesn't detect that need or have that stimulus to release those autocrine and paracrine hormones, it could just be the lack of those. And that could be, uh, to some degree, the cause of the toxic toxicity, because we don't know if it's necrosis, we don't know if it's lack of cell turnover or um, what the specific mechanism is. Yeah, it's great to take a peek and speculate as to what is actually causing the damage, because then you have a target for future study or an idea of things you can do to mitigate that. And uh, one thing I think we should bring up is for athletes who are competing and using Tomcat Ali for performance improvement, performance enhancement, um, the biological passport has become a pretty popular topic here lately with numerous you know, Olympic athletes you know, getting busted for different methods of doping. So um, Tomcat, based on the data we have, it isn't something you should be concerned about creating a flag. Uh, you may see increases in the testosterone level, but they're not going to be as significant as somebody using exogenous testosterone or using a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Um, those will reliably lead to increases in your urinary testosterone and epitestosterone, whereas uh, the paper we have on Tomcat Ali showed there was no change in the ratio there. And the authors didn't specifically note that there was an increase in the excretion of testosterone and epitestosterone. So in my opinion, I don't think it would be likely to cause a flag and have somebody to be disqualified. Yeah, uh, that's the good news. Uh, specifically with women, uh, including female athletes, many are on oral contraceptive pills because uh, having a child and conceiving at the right point in your life is uh, one of the top most important things that you can do to have um, good health, uh, you know, physically and mentally as well. And it can also be very detrimental. But 
uh, women that are on oral contraceptives, especially that have very high SHBGs, the combination of Toncat and Fidoja can both likely decrease the SHBG to some degree, and it can cause the release of more LH, which can help the theca cells work well, um, which can potentially be performance enhancing. Many Olympic athletes have hyperthecosis, which is where their theca cells just work too well. And some of them even have testosterone that are so high that they don't meet the cutoff for their uh, track and field events. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at uh, like in PCOS patients, for example, where there is some component of hyperandrogenism, the theca cells are producing testosterone in quantities, you know, often two, three, four times higher than their non-PCOS counterparts. So you can have a PCOS female who actually has higher levels of testosterone than a hypogonadal male. Mm -hmm. um, a, lo a lot of the co questions that we get have to do with well, what should I take? How much dose should I take specifically? This is my weight in kilograms. And uh, it's kind of hard to tell people without doing a full history and physical. Tell me more about your approach to a, a situation like that or what advice um, we could give people to talk to their doctors about. Yeah, so you wanna have a relationship with a healthcare provider that can take time and listen and hear about what your individual goals are. Um, and that understands the, the science and the literature behind supplementation. Uh, a lot of you know, primary care doctors just unfortunately do not have time to do that. So you wanna find the right doctor, or the right nurse practitioner, or physician assistant for yourself. And then the approach I take is, as I mentioned at the beginning, we look at the potential harm and the potential benefit. So you know, there's no free lunch. You always do potentially have side effects. Um, I'm you know, honest about the data that we see in the literature. So in Fedosia, we have maybe three or four studies total, um, zero in humans. So you know, I tell the patients that uh, with Tomcat Ali, uh, we do see improvements in things like you know, fertility parameters. We see testosterone improvements in uh, young men, older men, and also in women. So it appears to be a universal effect, whereas you do see sometimes um, in supplementation, you know, it's only been tested in older populations or it's only been tested in healthy adults. So you want to be able to look at the data and see, is this going to apply to this specific population or what population the supplements have been studied in? Absolutely. Some common things that I do tell patients, which may or may not be applicable to your situation, is when you do take a combination of Fedoja and Toncat, you want to cycle it on and off if, you, if you're taking both of them. Again, about one month on, at least one week off. And this is just a general protocol. I believe there's only one supplement that has people cycle it one month on, one week off, instead of take it continuously. And that's the supplement from Gorilla Mind, Derek's company. And we did help design this supplement specifically, partly for that reason. And uh, we're both very interested in Fedoja and Tonkat because it has the potential to help a lot of men and women avoid testosterone replacement or at least prolong the need for testosterone replacement. And it's relatively safe, but I do think it's important that we talk about the dangers of that. So for that reason, I recommend the supplement that I helped design. Of course, there's a little bit of bias in there, but whenever there's a potential risk and it's not talked about by the company, they might not have your best interest in mind. And at the end of the day, that's just what we want is we, you know, we became interested in these when Andrew Huberman was talking about them on Joe Rogan as well. And this is a way that you can most safely take something to help you improve your quality of life. Yeah, and let's talk about some of the other things that are in this product that other testosterone boosters may not have. Uh, because there are other things um, supplement wise you should be doing if you're trying to improve your testosterone um, and also certain things you'd be doing from a lifestyle standpoint if you're trying to improve your testosterone. So uh, let's talk about some of the other ingredients in there and then we can certainly touch on some lifestyle things as well. Definitely. So uh, a lot of humans, a lot of adults are deficient in zinc and magnesium, especially in North America. So there's zinc and magnesium. There's little downside to having zinc and magnesium in there. A few people uh, are sensitive to magnesium uh, as far as GI side effects, but it's usually magnesium oxide or citrate. So there's bioavailable forms of zinc and magnesium in the supplement. 
There's also vitamin D, which I would say is a very common cause of uh, lower testosterone. If you're deficient in vitamin D, it can uh, profoundly raise your testosterone. And it's very common again in North America or in many areas. It's even common in Indonesia. So vitamin D is very important. Um, there's also boron. So uh, boron somewhat transiently helps decrease SHBG. It also has several other benefits. Um, so uh, boron is a, a good thing to include. It is a potential goiterogen, but only if you take it in very high levels. So there's a nice low dose of boron. Soils in the Mediterranean tend to be higher in boron. So um, perhaps if you live in Greece or Turkey, you don't need the boron included. But again, it's another thing. Uh, when I think about testosterone optimization, and th this supplement is called Sigma, and it is called a testosterone booster because that's what people search for when they're looking for something. And we want to get this out to people to help them. But it's really optimizing. So you're not really taking anything that's gonna overcome whatever is holding you back when it comes to um, the reason why your testosterone is not in an optimal level. Vitamin D actually has some randomized control trial data supporting improvements in both free and total testosterone. Um, getting your vitamin D from the sunlight is terrific, um, but you want to get tested to see if you are converting that, if you're taking that sunlight and if it's translating to uh, optimal level of vitamin D, because I've seen people who are working construction in the summer, out in the sun for many hours each day, and they still don't have optimal levels of vitamin D. Another thing that magnesium can be very useful for is improving that conversion rate and absorption of vitamin D. Um, but to kind of get into some foundational things, um, sleep, diet, exercise, um, probably diet is the thing that is going to affect most people in a negative sense. So uh, one thing that we've seen is low fat diets. You know, people are trying to lose weight and they cut their fat intake as low as possible. And we see negative hormone production as a result of that. You can see a drop of uh, over 100 nanograms per deciliter and even further, depending on how far you are cutting your calories, you could actually self-induce some um, a hypogonadal state. So I've talked about this before and there is a phenomenon in females where they have athletes of menorrhea where they will stop menstruating because they are over-exercising and undernourished. And it's probably a similar phenomenon we're seeing in a lot of younger men who are trying to you know, get a six pack and they are doing so just by cutting their calories uh, far too low, cutting out dietary fats, and they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot in terms of their testosterone production. So what other lifestyle things uh, do you recommend for men who are wanting to uh, increase their testosterone levels or see just that they're covering all their bases from a hormonal standpoint? Uh, diet, as you mentioned, plenty of exercise, um, especially protein in the morning. Um, other things that uh, young men could consider is getting enough carbohydrates to at least keep their SHBG or free testosterone at a reasonable level. So a lot of people are picking up on the ketogenic diet and I've seen, we've both seen plenty of SHBGs over 100 and hypogonadal level free testosterones, but very high total testosterones. So that does seem to be quite common um, for, for that specific reason. Yeah, so the, the carnivore diet is a good way to increase your testosterone potentially, but you're not going to get an actual increase in the free testosterone more often than not because the SHBG tends to be sky high. So um, it's not the, the diet model that I'm recommending for my patients. Now, there are a small subset of people that do find some benefit there. So important to work with your doctor and, and outline your goals just as we keep repeating. Um, but as far as you know, sleep quality, um, there's a, a ton of foundational things you need to do to get good sleep. You want a cool, quiet, dark room. You want to be getting uh, at least seven hours of sleep a night. If you have several days of sleep deprivation, uh, we have the literature to show uh, your testosterone levels and you know, in general, your quality of life and your mental function, which are far more important than the testosterone levels transiently are gonna be impaired, even things like uh, your driving performance. So getting quality sleep is gonna be paramount. Um, other things like certain exercise protocols have been shown to increase testosterone. Um, I've seen people who are essentially um, not getting good sleep, um, not getting you know, enough exercise or not doing the right kinds of exercise. 
uh, that are borderline hypogonadal make some changes and then they move themselves into a much better place. So what are some of those exercise protocols that you recommend uh, somebody who's just looking to optimize their health and as an added benefit, get their hormone profile in a favorable place? Some of this is personal preference, but everyone should do zone two cardiovascular exercise. So hard enough to make you sweat a little bit, but you can talk. It's, it's quite easy. It's probably easier than you think. And I would do that at least three days a week, if not more, for at least ideally 30 minutes at a time or more. But you can do it in smaller segments if you need to. Some people love interval training and high intensity training, and there is benefits to vigorous exercise. Um, a lot of it's endorphin related or substance P there's a, there's a lot of benefits, but specifically for hormone optimization, resistance training seems to be better than specifically the vigorous high intensity interval training. Yeah. The resistance training and focusing on multiple joint compound movements, things like, uh, you know, bench squat and deadlift. And it's important to make sure that you. Um, are doing these things with good form. Um, otherwise, you can end up injuring yourself and heading backwards instead of heading forwards. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it's, if it's Duncan French that came up with the protocol, but Duncan French or another uh, elite trainer uh, for natural testosterone optimization, six hard sets of squats or perhaps deadlifts, six hard sets and 10 reps a piece. Yes, I did, I did see yeah. that he was talking about in a shorter rest interval than you may be used to. So I believe it was about two minutes between sets. Yeah, a quick rest interval. In general, when thinking about testosterone optimization, there's not a perfect analogy for it, but uh, think of if you're having suboptimal testosterone levels, then you need to identify what's holding you back. It's usually not something that you need to optimize from 95% to 99%. There's usually something that you can find that's holding you back. I think of it as the same system when you try to get into a fraternity or sorority, then you can be best friends with half the sorority or fraternity, but if half of them give you a black ball, then you're not going to get in. So you have to find every single vector or every single thing that we've talked about and then identify which one is holding you back. And then that's what you concentrate your effort on. If your exercise is already pretty decent, then it's probably not that. If your sleep is already pretty good, then it's probably not that. So you need to look and find something else. Yeah, and that's a, a great framework to use for any type of um, a health challenge or anything you're trying to accomplish. You want to take a multifaceted approach. Um, if you hyper-focus on one variable and get that dialed in, if there's something you know glaring or another you know root cause problem, then you're never going to be 100% dialed in. Um, you know, a common thing is, you know, somebody has you know sleep apnea. It, it doesn't matter how much vitamin D they're taking. You know, that's not going to fix the root cause of the issue. Exactly. I guess we'll start to uh, tie tie things up. Um, a lot of people will ask in the comments, and we'll put this in the text somewhere too. What's the best protocol to start, to start with? So starting with, uh, if you're a candidate for this and if you talk to your healthcare provider about it, then uh, you can get some Gorilla Mind Sigma and that has both the uh, Fidoja and it has the Tonkat. You can take two capsules, which is a serving size if you look at the facts on the back. There's no proprietary blends. You can see exactly what's in it. And I don't see any reason why not to take it with some Tudka or NAC or Taurine, perhaps off and on, one month on. Maybe get some labs just to do another case study and let us know how those labs look and then take at least a week off. In addition to that, one other interesting thing you can add in is fenugreek, which is not very efficacious on its own, but the last few enzymes that lead to testosterone that Fidoja and Tonkat don't help with, that does. So again, if you try it with and without fenugreek, let us know as well. Yeah, I think those are great suggestions, Kyle. And if there's anything we didn't cover, if there's any more questions that anyone has about Tonkat Ali or Fidoja or testosterone, uh, certainly leave those things in the comments. We'll be happy to take a look at them and hopefully answer those in a future podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. And may God bless you with health and happiness.